Hello everyone, this is Craig Fitch with Oculus. Welcome to another Oculus webinar. We certainly thank you for attending this webinar this evening, Advances in Corneal Collagen Crosslinking and the Oculus Pentacam. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please use the question box at the right of your screen. There will be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. Tonight's speaker is Dr. William Trattler. Dr. William Chatler performs a wide variety of cataract and refractive surgeries. He's also an investigator for corneal crosslinking. And tonight, he will be sharing us his experiences with the Pentacam and corneal crosslinking. Please welcome Dr. William Chatler. Thank you, everyone. It's really my pleasure to share with you my experience with corneal college and crosslinking. I'm going to share my, um, my technique and how we as a group are involved in a clinical trial have been very successful with crosslinking. I'm happy to discuss any and all aspects of crosslinking and also share with you since Oculus is kind enough to sponsor this webinar, how do we utilize the Pentacam to evaluate our patients prior to crosslinking as well as once we perform the crosslinking procedure, how we can follow um, to see how patients respond to the crosslinking procedure. So with that, um, as you know, I'm from Miami. I'm at the Center for Excellence and Eye Care in Miami, Florida. I have a great group of doctors that are part of my group. I also want to thank, I know one or two of my um, colleagues have been researched with are on the line, including uh, potentially uh, Brian Frank, who's a medical student at the University of Miami, who's helped with research, as well as Gabby Perez and some other um, uh, many young doctors who have helped me um, with their research. So we're going to move forward and see if we can advance the slide. Uh, always important to give that disclosure. I do have a financial interest in a company called CXLO that has the hope to bring uh, get an FDA approval for crosslinking in the U.S. I'm also a speaker uh, for Oculus. Um, so I just want to share with you first as we talk about crosslinking uh, the Pentacam. And this is just a typical map that I look at in patients that are either coming in for an evaluation for crosslinking and they have keratoconus, or patients that have had, that have had crosslinking and trying to see the differences over time. And you can see that this is a difference map, and the middle map is where there's a red, you can see the red bar in the middle, um, shows uh, the November 2013 um, map. And then we have a map on the left, which is from June 2014. And so this is called a difference map. And what this software does is it compares the two maps, the pre-op and the uh, post-op map, and gives you the difference map, which is the difference between A and B. And in this, blue is flatter, and green and yellow are steeper. And this patient that underwent crosslinking uh, in their eye, you can see that, the, that it got flatter below, which is where you want it to get flatter, and got steeper above. Because if you look at the, um, the two maps side by side, it's really hard to tell the differences um, that occurred. But by using this difference map technology, you can actually see the changes over time. And I go over these maps with my patients to give them a sense of how they're progressing following the crosslinking procedure. I'll show more of these uh, throughout, the, throughout the discussion. And this is just showing the K-max, which went from 68.9 uh, to sorry, from 68.9 to 66.4, so it changed about 2.5 doctors. Um, you can see the from the middle to the um, uh, to the left one, and the difference is over here on the right. So you can point that out to patients that there was a flattening in their K-max. And you can see also in specific spots, you can you know, it was defined by four doctors. Now, I also do love procedure disc topography, and it works very well for mild keratoconus. When you get more advanced keratoconus, and there's a patient that had very severe keratoconus, a K-max of 97.6. Uh, normal, as you are probably aware, is about 45 or 46. So this is a very steep cornea. The procedure disc technology can't image and interpret these maps. It's just too steep for a procedure disc. But thankfully, this is the same patient. I'll show you the patient with the Pentacam. You can see the patient with the Pentacam. Uh, it is visible, and you can see I put the color scale on, on the left, where, where the very, very light red is, is, is super steep in the 90 range. You can see where it gets very, very steep in this cornea. But you can image this eye, and you can tell the difference between. You see how this is more helpful, because you can do you get different snaps. Um, over time to help see how these eyes respond to crosslinking. And yes, these type of patients can have crosslinking with that be on and do well. Now here's a patient of mine that, that came in for a consultation for um, crosslinking. And I, he's a 10-year-old, and I evaluated him and performed this uh, Pentacam and 
what I look at is I look at the uh, K max here was 58.7, and the thinnest location is 50, 521 microns. This is all the information I get from the Pentacam. And so it's January of this year, and I told them, and we discussed with the families they should have cross-linking. Obviously, as a, a, a patient in school, so we decided to wait until spring break to have their cross-linking. But what happened what was interesting, that you can do this in the younger patient, they can actually progress quite a bit. So the K-max went from 58.7, and he, so you can go here. Now, this is April 22nd, so three months later, it went all the way up to 63.0. So we had a, 60, a, a significant increase in the K-max over just three months. So for younger patients, and I've always been uh, trying to encourage younger patients to not wait too long for cross-linking, um, this is, shows that even over a couple months, there can be significant progression in their corneal shape over time. The corneal also thin, I'm going to go back one slide, showing you the, pre the, the first visit. You see the thinnest location is 506 three months later. It started off at 521, so there's the mild thinning of the cornea, but more importantly, the cornea was getting much deeper. Um, over this three-month period, and cross-linking is a powerful procedure, but it can't, you know, completely normalize the cornea. So the sooner we can get help these patients, the better. Now, obviously, that was a young patient, but we have older patients. So here's a, a patient I saw in, in, in um, August of 2008, and you see the patient has pretty significant um, keratoconus with the red again uh, showing steepness. And comparing the, their maps from 2008 to 2012. See that the patient has significant steepening essentially, and a K-max steepened from 59.4 to 63.8 over the four-year, four-year, um, two-month period. This is a patient that was 63 years old. So, for her, even though many doctors would say, you know, just don't worry about your keratoconus, your cornea is probably stable and steep. It's stable. You can see that she actually did have progression, and she did have um, some slight, you know worsening her vision. She's not a contact lens wearer. Um, and the point being is that even patients that are older can benefit from, you know, can, can, you can consider crossing because they can progress over time. Now, what about intact? Now, intact is another nice therapy for patients with keratoconus that can reshape the cornea. Uh, and there's been some studies looking at whether intact can lock down patients with keratoconus and help reduce progression. And it seems that it, it, some studies suggest that the progression rate does reduce with intact. But I did want to show with you one of, uh, a patient of mine. I'm actually friends with the patient. Um, I've known um, him for a while, but he came in and I looked at the change in shape over time with the Pentacam difference maps. So here you can take a look. Uh, this is a patient, uh, again, with keratoconus. And you can see from, uh, from 2012 to just July 2014, even though he had intact in his, in his eye, there was progression over time. And so the key being is that, the key, key thing to understand is that um, intact, eyes with intact um, can still have progression, and therefore you might want to still consider um, crossing these new patients. Now the last little topic I'll, I'll get to before I really talk about the specifics of cross-linking for keratoconus is this particular patient. So this is a patient that came in for an evaluation trying to decide if they had keratoconus. And when we look at the Pentacam, you see that we get the sagittal um, curvature on the top left. That's, um, that's similar to the axial map that we see with preceded this topography. The lower left is the coronal thickness map. The upper right map is the elevation in the front surface, and the bottom right is the elevation in the back surface. And so you can see, this is the map that we look at typically when a patient comes in for their first visit for uh, for uh, consideration of, of whether they have keratoconus and whether crossing would be helpful. And what you can see here just, you know, from this view is that um, the astigmatism is very symmetrical, so it's not, there's no skewed axis, but there does appear to be a little inferior steepening on the sagittal view. So let's look a little more, a little more closely. Um, this is the same map. You can see the left map is the sagittal curvature. You can see that, you know, the top part is 44.7, down below, it's 47.0. So there is some interior steepening, and it's not, even though the axis is symmetrical, it's not skewed. Um, when you look at the elevation of the back surface, you can see that there is some protrusion of the posterior surface uh, coming forward. So this is a sense that the cornea is kind of bulging forward. Both the, the front part of the cornea and the back part are showing this 
um, you know, this uh, protrusion. And you can see the thinnest point of the cornea is this little black circle right here. I'm hoping it shows up right there. It's right where the plus 29 is in the elevation in the back. And this is, you know, the thinnest spot of the cornea, you know, conforming to or showing in the same spot as where the thinnest, where the elevation is in the back surface. This is very suggestive of early keratoconus in a patient. The other map I look at is the thickness map. And you can see this is the Penicam thickness map. Again, showing the thinnest spot is not central, but but is now displaced inferiorly. Again, this, this patient would have um, early keratoconus and would be a candidate for coronal college and cross-linking um, at this stage. And the other map I like to use is this, um, tech, uh, this map developed by um, Michael Berlin and Renato Ambrosio called the percentage thickness increase, or the PTI. And it's a good, good thought in how they developed this. Um, the concept was is that there's a normal ratio between the central thickness of the cornea and the peripheral thickness of the cornea. But in patients with keratoconus who get central thinning, the thinning occurs centrally but not peripherally. So you expect that the ratio or the, or the change in coronal thickness from the center to the periphery will be higher in patients that have keratoconus because the cornea is unnaturally thin centrally, but still the same thickness peripherally. So this map just starts, starts at the zero, the very center of the cornea, looks at the percentage thickness increase. Um, and you can see that, that when it goes below the third black dot dashed line, the red line goes below that. That means that the cornea um, was thinner centrally and uh, the rate of, of, of change from center to, to periphery was much more rapid than is typically seen in patients, in normal patients. So this would be, again, suggestive that the patient has early keratoconus. Now, crossing was developed by Taylor Seiler in 1998, and he, he developed this technology by um, basically scraping the epithelial surface, applying riboflavin for 30 minutes, and then the UV light for 30 minutes. And the, thankfully, the technology has come a long way, but it's really Taylor Seiler, Michael Merkin, and others who really helped um, bring, develop this technology and bring it to where it is today. Um, the Dresden technique was a uh, uh, very straightforward technique, which is where you put anesthetic drops in the cornea. You basically remove the epithelium, apply riboflavin drops for 30 minutes, followed by a UV light for 30 minutes, and afterwards you place a bandage kind of lens in the eye and let the, ep the epithelium heal over five to six days. It's very similar to PRK in the way that the eye heals. Um, which is good and bad. I mean, we know with PRK that patients do well, but there still is an increase of complications because the epithelium doesn't always fit the way we want. The other challenge in patients with keratoconus is that they have very steep corneas. The typical bandage type of lens we use with PRK doesn't work the same way with keratoconus, and that can actually impact the way the epithelium heals. So there are challenges with FDR crosslinking, but obviously it does have some nice effects. Now, when you think about FDF cross-linking, one of the big questions that is asked is you take out the epithelium, you perform the cross-linking, and then over the first month, does the epithelium, uh, do you get, does the cornea become steeper and thicker? I should say the whole cornea. Does the whole cornea become steeper and thicker, steeper and thinner, flatter and thicker, or flatter and thinner? So what, what changes do you really see over the first month after coronal collagen cross-linking would be FDF? It actually turns out that the cornea becomes steeper, not flatter over the first month, but thinner. So you do see some thinning in the cornea, but you see the cornea being steeper. It looks confusing. We didn't really expect that when we first started doing cross-linking. But what we realized after seeing this phenomenon is that patients with keratoconus actually have very thin epithelial layers. And so we scrape off the epithelium and epi off, the epithelium regrows back um, to this normal thickness, to the normal 50 micron thickness. It's only after a couple months that it starts to thin out so that you get this, um, until you get to the point where the um, epithelium returns to the state it was at prior to the crossing. So that's why the first month you see the, the coronal steepness being a little bit steeper. About three months it gets back to baseline, and then at one year it's typically much thinner than it was pre op. And this is just a study that um, from Taylor Siler, um, Wollenstack, and Spurl where they looked at patients with progressive keratoconus, perform epi-off cross-linking. And what we see is that at six months, you get a nice flattening of the cornea. And then at one year, a little flatter. 
So anyway, let's have a three results is even better than one year result. I was just at a conference in um, um, in London where um, actually uh, it was presented in London where uh, Teo Sauer presented one of his patients that came back eight years after crosslinking, and from year four to year eight, he had the patient had significant, further significant flattening of the cornea. So, so it seems that crosslinking doesn't just have a one or two or three year impact on the cornea. You can still see flattening many years after the procedure. Now, epi-off crosslinking has a great track record, but there are risks of crosslinking. Epi-off crosslinking they include delays in epithelial healing. Um, corneal ulcers, uh, corneal haze, and there have been some reports of endothelial cell damage and decompensation with epi -off. And these are risks that are serious, but thankfully they're uncommon. So in general, cross, epi -off crossing is effective and safe, but there are these increased risks. So the epi -off crossing, most surgeons around the world are, are typically waiting for patients to show progression of their disease before performing epi -off crossing, except in kids, just because there is a risk to the procedure. It's not benign. But it does work, you know, patients require cross -linking. Now, when I compare epion and epi-off, I think that uh, this very little thing is sharp, but let's talk about the comparison. So I'm going to make a case for today that, that epion is equivalent to epi-off as far as how it reshapes the cornea. The medical literature is still up in the air as, as whether epion is as is as effective as epioff, but it's definitely been our experience in our multi-genetic clinical trial that it is as effective. Um, and I'll share some of the pros why our results are a little bit better than some of the international results. Um, the the peer-reviewed literature also is a little bit questionable on whether epion is, is as effective as epioff at stopping progression of predicates. But again, it's really the technique that epion is performed, and that's why the reference paper epion is not as effective and doesn't stop progression. But they don't really use a robust and effective technique for epion crosslinking. I kind of think of it as if you go to a restaurant and try someone's whatever dish you're going to talk about, it's not good. It doesn't mean that it's always not going to be good everywhere you go. It's just you're not preparing something properly and you get a bad result. It may not be, it just may be the technique, not necessarily the, the way, the, the actual item. So anyway, I hope that analogy is okay. But anyway, when you compare epion and epioff, some of the challenges are that there is an increased risk of infection of corneal ulcers, delays in epithelial healing, and corneal haze. Um, and both epion and epioff are effective, but there's still a small risk of progression despite either procedure. And with I've seen uh, I've never seen progression of epioff because I only have a small experience with epioff, but I have some patients progress with epion. It's simply less than one uh, percent. But when you look at the medical literature, there's still a risk of progression with epi-off, um, depending on the paper. So it's not 100% successful either. Thankfully, with either procedure, you can perform a second procedure. And, and for all my patients that were questionable as to whether they may have progressed, I perform repeat epion. I've had no one progress after a second epion procedure. Um, so that's been a good finding. Now, the key to being successful with trans epi crosslinking is um, this technique. And we, we've used a variety of different riboflavin formulations, but the key is that this corneal protective sponge, and by using a sponge on the cornea, when you place drops directly on the sponge, the drops sit on, directly on the cornea and can soak in. We also use tetracaine or alkane, which is either one. Um, they have beacane in every two to five minutes. That also helps break down the, the epithelium. And so it's a combination of the riboflavin on the sponge and the tetracaine that helps to break down the epithelial barrier enough to get plenty of riboflavin into the cornea. Now, depending on your formulation, it can take an hour or longer to load the cornea. So you have to look very carefully at the cornea prior to initiating the UV light. That's the biggest flaw in the European studies that they just treat it for 30 minutes with drops, no sponge, and then initiate the UV light without checking to confirm there's enough riboflavin in the cornea. And so what I do and what Dr. Rubenfeld and the others in our clinical trial do is we look at the sodium and Here's two examples of, of looking at the lamp at the riboflavin. You can see there's plenty of riboflavin fluorescing in the corneal stroma throughout from the top to the bottom. It's not superficial. It goes all the way through the cornea. And when you see a cornea loaded like this, you can initiate the UV light. However, you have a patient like this, which is one of my earlier cases where I use drops. When you get enough penetration 
our bronchial phase in, in the area where it's dark blue. The area where it's fluorescing, the yellow, the, the, the green, excuse me, that has plenty of radical in the cornea, and the cross-section shows that it has plenty of radical in, in the cornea, but that central, that paracentral blue area is the area where there just was not enough radical in um, saturating the cornea. So if you perform crossing in this patient, you get an inadequate result, and so this patient requires more loading before you initiate UV light. Now, with this protocol, we've had really good success, and here's a patient of mine, 68 years old, um, with Terry Connors, and the patient had a cataract that was early, and the patient wanted to see what could be done prior to the cataract surgery to give them a better result. And um, so what we did is we offered cross-linking, and the patient underwent cross-linking. Um, again, this pointing out that when you do epi on, it's very safe and steep corneas, but one of the problems with, with epi off is that we have very steep corneas, corneas there's an increased risk of delays in epithelial healing, um, and so that's why the state provides uh, Cheo, Saller, um, Mycobrokin, and Kohler recommended that you avoid the really steep corneas with epi off just because there's an increased risk of um, delays in healing and other complications. So here's our patient um, right and left eye prior to crossing team. Um, 68 year old male. And just uh, the other point to make is you have two eyes, right and left eye. What, the right eye is less advanced, the left eye is way more advanced. Which eye has achieved more flattening with cross linking? It's important to understand that the steeper the cornea, the greater the results. So here is the right eye. This is pre op, and then I'm going to show you 18 months later. You can see that there is significant flattening of the cornea. You can see nice, good optical zone essentially. This patient. Um, it's scheduled for character I think, in the near future with the referring doctor, and we expect the patient to do very, very well with their character surgery in this right eye. The significant change in the cornea over 18 months. So we get to the left eye. Here's the left eye. And you can see the difference. Now, it doesn't look as, as, as robust of a result when you look at just the red, but if you compare the K-max change, the numbers, you'll see that it went from 69.4 to 59.7, so significant flattening. Um, and this patient is, would definitely um, could sense the improvement overall in their, their overall visual quality. And now we expect that even though 18 months seems like a long time, we expect further improvement over the next 18 months. And so that's the nice thing about crossing. It doesn't end at 18 months or at 12 months. It can keep going. It can keep seeing further improvements. Um, again, their surgery is scheduled um, in, the, in the near future. Um, and obviously, I typically recommend shooting for about a minus one in these patients uh, because we expect further flattening to occur in the cornea. Now, we are doing a, a, a multi-center clinical trial called CFL USA. These are our investigators. Um, I think they have all the investigators um, uh, here throughout the U.S. Um, this has been an IRB-sponsored study, but we actually will be switching to an FDA um, IND study or be a physician-sponsored IND study in, in the near future. Um, but currently it's an IRB study, and again, we're, as I mentioned, we're going to be switching to, an I, to a physician-sponsored IND study uh, for recommendations by the FDA. But anyway, you can see here from our multiple sites, we do have sites throughout the U.S., um, uh, and our indications are for age uh, 8 and over, for keratoconus, normal post keratoconus, blues, and post ectasia. They also help with patients that have um, carrions, um, which is one for, uh, another type of corneal thinning, and also patients with a previous RK that have diurnal fluctuations in their vision. And I'm just sharing uh, my results. I looked at just my Epion crossing the patients who had advanced keratoconus. This is patients with a K-max of 60 or above. Um, just trying to show that they can get some very robust results. And, and obviously we're working to get all our patients to come back for follow-up, but we had two-year follow-up. And you can see the difference from one year to two years is uh, nice. And, we had about a doctor flattening at one year, and when we get to two years, we get um, a, a, an average of two doctors of flattening um, in our patients. And overall, our patients with steep corneas um, do very, very well, and, and we're very happy with the results. Um, if I avoided these patients, would have higher risk to get off because of the fact that the epithelium is harder to heal in these very steep corneas. And here's a patient of mine who's going to share a couple of cases. Um, this is a pre-op case at 56 year old male. Who, his best work of vision is actually 2025. He either had this kind of you know, early keratoconus. We talked in, in, at great length of whether they are proceed with cross linking, and the patient, again, knew that at some point they would have to have cataract surgery and wanted to see if they could have improvement in the coronal shape. And over 
after the treatment, you can see the best cancer visual acuity went from 2025 to 2020. The myopia dropped from minus 7 and changed to minus 3.75. And the patient had improvement in their quality of vision. They had significant improvement. This is an older patient, but they're extremely pleased with their Epion uh, um, procedure. Here's another patient. So not only does it work for um, keratoconus, but also can look, work for post-basic acacia. We have a patient here who's a younger patient and got pretty rapid um, development of, of acacia after their LASIK procedure. The patient was referred to me. Um, and this is just showing that um, you can get this nice flattening, um, you know, over this very short time period. Um, as I mentioned, that with epiocter, you get deeper first as the epithelium heals in, and then you get back to normal about three months. But here you can see we're already seeing significant flattening at three months with Epion. The patient knows the improvement in quality vision uh, with the rest of visual acuity improving in 2025. Now here's another patient of mine with post basic acacia. We have occlusive pattern. See, it's like a lobster claw pattern. As I mentioned previously, we do these difference maps. The middle map is the pre-op. The map on the left is the post-op, and then the difference map. What I thought was really interesting was that the patient had a pellucid pattern, and as the cornea reshaped itself, you can see that it improved entirely in a pellucid pattern. So you see, I circled the minus two here where it got flatter. But then it not only improved in a pellucid pattern, pellucid pattern, but also got steeper superiorly. So what we see is crossing here. It's not only a flattening of the steep area of the cornea, but actually deepening of the flat area of the cornea as it reshapes itself um, and gets, and that's why patients experience better quality vision after crossing team because it's not only the deep part getting flatter, but the flat part also gets steeper. Now here's one of my youngest patients I treated, a nine-year-old male, and he came in with his uncorrected visual acuity of 2100, and his best corrected visual acuity, both at the optometrist who referred him to me and in my center was 2050. And he just could not, he did not see well, and he had some major issues in his quality and his vision overall. It was pretty amazing, at close up day two, his uncorrected visual acuity was 2025, and his best corrected visual acuity um, had improved from 2050 to 2025. Um, he had a slight improvement in, in the refraction. This is a difference map just two days later, showing significant flattening in his patient's cornea. And um, the patient, you know, is now uh, two years out. Unfortunately, they live in a different state. I'm not coming back to see me, but the mother does keep in touch with me and um, has, has shared it, that her son is doing fantastic in school. Um, and has, had, has maintained this excellent improvement in their vision on cross-linking. And here's another a very important patient of mine. So at age nine, I performed um, uh, topography on this patient, and um, you can see that the topography looks very normal. And obviously, the only reason I performed topography in such a young patient is because it was actually my daughter. And I just, she had developed myopia, and I just thought, well, why not get topography? I was surprised that when she came back at age 12 years, 9 months, that she actually had had a significant reduction in her overall vision and had developed astigmatism. And when we did the topography, this is actually the 10K map, she developed significant inferior steepening in both eyes. You can see that she, just the, the red areas below, um, she was a kind of, in the red eye, she's 40.5 above, and she's 46.7 just at the first kind of little red area, just, just, um, where the red area is in the red eye, she went from you know, in the 41, 42 range in the left eye to 46.8. So she had developed significant change in her coronal maps over a couple of years. Now she's not eye rubber, but clearly this is early keratoconus. So I explained that thankfully we had worked hard on Epion, and back in um, uh, early 2013 we performed bilateral um, Epion cross procedure, and she did it beautifully with the procedure. Um, and you can see this is a three month result, and you know, she maintained her excellent quality vision, but you can see the difference maps show she had significant flattening in fairly. This is her um, right eye, and I'll show you her left eye. Here's her left eye. So she, you know, I circled the kind of areas of change where she flattened by about 0.9 and 1.1 doctors of flattening. And again, she ended up with, you know, very good vision overall. Now, I did it in 2013, so she came back this summer and I did her 18 month visit. See, she's had even further improvement in her the reshaping of her cornea. You can see that she got 1.6 doctors flatter, where she has a red circle. But if you notice above, she also got steeper above. She's reshaping her cornea, and her uncorrected vision improved from 2080 to 2050. And you know, thankfully, I rarely see her wear glasses, although 
she does bring glasses to school when she sits in certain classes, but usually she's glasses free. Um, these are left eye, showing again improvement in her overall vision um, and significant flattening below and some seeping above. So I hope you know, my talk has been overall very helpful in kind of comparing and contrasting epi on versus epi off. I think epi off is a nice procedure, uh, but I don't think it's necessary. I think you can get the same results with epi on um, as far as the amount of flattening. But then also what's helpful is we can also um, avoid all the complications. So I do find that, um, again, it's been effective in our center and, and also at the, in the entire state study with a clinical trial, it's stopping progression of keratoconus even, even in young patients. But also we've avoided all the complications you can see with epi off. And in the rare situation where it was either epi off or epi on needed a second treatment, epi on works very well in the situation and we've got great results when needed for these patients. And the last thing I want to go over, and, and again, I still wanted to patient, people that I've shared my talk with that we really want to understand how to do be successful with epi cross I just want to go over this one more time. It's just very simple. The coil protector sponge is key. By having a sponge on the cornea, it really allows the rosin to soak into the cornea. The anesthetic drops help break down the epithelial barrier for, further, and it's this combination that really works well. And again, you want to listen to them to make sure you have plenty of riboflavin present in the cornea before initiating UV light. And I have no problems when I see patients after loading the cornea, and they're not ready. I just can, you know, have them just do a little bit more rival flavor until we get enough so we can get effective, effective treatment for these patients. Um, and just really, you know, look carefully at the cornea to make sure that there's uniform and significant saturation with rival flavor of the cornea. So again, the advantage of FE on crossing, it avoids most of the risks associated with crosslinking. And we can actually treat thinner corneas as well because we don't have to remove that 50 microns of epithelium. Um, and it's extremely convenient for patients as well because they can return to their pre-op baseline in one to two days. And many of my patients can drive the next day or 48 hours later. And you can return to the contact lens where in, in two days with typical contact lenses, although the scleral lenses, scleral lenses, they can return the next day. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I hope this is a nice overview of cross hunting. You're always also welcome to email me at wtratler at gmail.com. Dr. Chatler, thank you very much. That was a very educational webinar. Dr. Chatler, thank you very much on behalf of Oculus and the attendees. We thank you very much for your time and the educational webinar you have shared with us. We look forward to working with you again in the near future. Uh, it's my pleasure. Again, if anybody uh, still on the call wants to ask further questions, uh, they're welcome to email me. My email is wtratler at gmail.com. I think if you Google me, usually I have lots of articles that have my email associated. Happy to help. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Schattler. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending another great educational webinar by Oculus and, and Dr. Trattler. Please keep watching your emails and Oculus website for other educational webinars on different instruments and topics. This webinar tonight has been recorded and will be available on the Oculus website within a couple of weeks. If you have any questions at all or um, you want to send me an email as well, you can um, access our website at www.oculususa.com or you can access my email at C as in Charlie, F as in Frank, I, T for Tommy, C-H at oculususa.com. That's C Fitch at oculususa.com. Thank you very much and have a good evening.